open our eyes once again tonight to the reality that we're walking and living in that we sometimes miss because of being distracted by the things of this present world system. Remind us again tonight, Lord, and fill our hearts to overflowing with gratitude and joy because of what you've made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a seat. If you've got your Bible with you, we're going to be in the New Testament, first part, then we're going to shift gears and go to Psalm 91. Now, I'll tell you up front, you don't have to open uh, the Bible or follow every little nuance um, uh, as we give you these scriptures, but it will help you if you have Psalm 91 open also. But I'll be reading them to us, so you don't really have to. But first of all, we're looking at 2 Timothy tonight, chapter 4, and we're looking at verses 6 through 8. Second letter of Paul to Timothy, chapter 4, and verses 6 through 8. If you need prayer tonight, that's great. We're here to agree with you and pray with you, but you might want to keep your distance. Solomon says, barn shoes, barn shoes. In other words, I'm carrying an aroma. So if you're not, <laughs> if you're not horse friendly, it weren't me. I get a shower once a month whether I need it or not. But uh, I still had my same shoes on because Barb kind of took a little poolie and I had to uh, feed instead of her, but it all worked out. Uh, two kinds of people, uh, horse lovers and not. And how do you know? You walk into a barn, if you say, ah, you're a horse lover. If you walk in and say, eh, you're not. Yeah, sure, whatever you need to do. And others who contribute to the fellowship and we're able to upgrade and take advantage of the, the best technology so we can capture the word and uh, keep it going out, amen? I'm so glad people write books, how about you? or you know, make tapes, CDs, and so on. Really helpful because if they take off, you know, if they go upstairs, goodness, um, that's it. But if we have their books, we have their videos or their CDs, it's like they're still here. How many of you know how many people of our fellowship are? I know, right? Very sad. I looked at the directory, you know, we're like, I think our, our membership was probably double about a decade ago, and we won't even talk about it attendance, will we? And it's sad, but unfortunately it's, it's everywhere nowadays. Even the, the big mega churches are, are losing out. Everybody's got their church in their hand, you know. Just a dial up. I won't go there. Second Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not to me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. What we're going to do tonight is begin with the end. Uh, how do you write a good mystery story or a good mystery novel? You figure the end out. If you have the end then you just write backwards. You already know where it's going to go, and then it's kind of easy. Somebody asked Mickey Spillane how he wrote all those Mike Hammer books so quickly, and he said uh, that was the way he did it. Figured out the end and then just wrote up to it. This is the end of the matter. Think about this. This is, this is Paul uh, not too far from his promotion. We don't know how old he was when he died. I would say he was officially past the 6-5 number. He was probably maybe 70. Who knows? We don't really know how old he was, you know, when we first have record of him. But he was, he was up there. And um, as we look at the end of his life, I want you to think about the end of the psalm that we've been looking at that he's illustrating for us, Psalm 91, a person who lives under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 91, 16, the last verse says, with long life, the text says literally length of days, talking about a literal longevity. With long life, I will satisf satisfy him and show him my salvation. I like that word satisfy. It's where we get the English word satiate, you know, and it means to be fully satisfied. 
If you've ever been at a, a buffet where it's all you can eat, you know what that what that's like. Some people literally do that. <laughs> they eat till they just can't eat anymore. I won't go get into what the Romans used to do. Some of you know that. But it's interesting. The last word, uh, in addition to a long life, he'll, I'll show him my salvation. I, you've probably heard different people mention it. A, a related Hebrew root is Yeshua, which I could find one time in the Old Covenant actually appears as a proper name. And, and uh, our Lord's name was similar. It refers to Yahweh being salvation. So we could say, in a sense, I will show him my Savior. I will show him my son. I will show him the God-man, the Lord Jesus. And again, Paul lived this. Paul lived Psalm 91, 16. At the end of his career, as we're going to see, he could look back and as a Jewish rabbi who had found his Messiah, he could look at all the blessings that are promised there and we can see in his life and what he said, he lived it. Now, the nice thing about this, among many things, is the fact that you and I can read ourselves in. Because this is not just because he had apostolic ministry. It's because he was a man of faith. How many are believers? So this is for all of us. Isn't that great news? We don't have to have a certain level in ministry or whatever to enjoy this. He met the person of salvation when he was Saul before he became Pavlos on the road to Damascus and Jesus arrested him. Now listen to what he says. For I, I am already being poured out and the time of my departure has arrived. Most Bible scholars, most people that study the word, believe what he's talking about there being poured out is the drink offering, you know, that accompanied a lot of the sacrifices in the old covenant, first fruits and so on, Pentecost. They had this drink offering where they would pour out wine in the presence of Yahweh and sometimes a gallon or more. So we're not talking about a little dabble, do you? You know, this is, this is a pretty good serving. And what's it mean? Does it mean that, you know, God expects us all to be half in the bag 24-7? No. But it does mean that Paul had given full measure of his life, is what it's saying. When Jesus arrested him on the road to Damascus, when he first entered into the secret place, when he first was clothed with that tent that he talks about, he never lost his gratitude. He never lost focus of why it had happened. And he simply lived it to the place where he said, I'm ready for the dregs, if you will, the last drops to be poured out in my service for the Lord. And isn't it interesting that he uses the word departure? Anybody here sick? Good. Anybody here familiar with sickness? You've been sick. Yeah. You've got a problem. You know, I can tell you any minister can tell you within 30 seconds what are the two most important prayer requests he gets from anybody. It doesn't matter what kind of ministry, you know, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. It doesn't matter. Two things people want prayer about mostly. Can you, know what, can you think of what they are? Thank you, Mark. Money and health. That's, that's the big two. That's right, the big two. Money and health. And uh, this hopefully will be important to you. It really blessed my socks off. That's why I got my pants kind of long tonight, so you can't see it. I'm not wearing it. The word departure is analiseos, analiseos, which means to be loosed or set free. It was used of a, of a ship, a boat, freed from its moorings, or some farm animal that was free from the yoke. You know, you ever take a saddle off a horse you've just ridden? Boom, they usually take off and then they roll in the dirt, you know, if they're sweaty or whatever, you know, water them down. So it, he's talking about being loosed. Very interesting that Peter, in 2 Peter, uh, let's see where, where that is. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. I think, I thought I had it written down here, uh, but I might not. Yeah, I do. Listen, listen to what... Um, 
Peter said along the same line. Please, again, read yourself into this tonight. I'm definitely doing that. This is not just Paul, not just Peter. This is every believer. This has nothing to do with full-time ministry or what we do for the Lord, just being a believer. Peter belonged to the same denomination as Paul. This is what he said, 2 Peter 1, 13 through 15. I think it right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that the putting off of my tent comes swiftly, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me, yes, I will make every effort that you may be always able to remember these things even after my departure. Yet another word. You know what that word is, departure? Exodon. Exodon, from exodus, which means literally exit. Now, why is that important? This is a lot of free information here besides our, our main subject. You are not your body. I am not my body. Two different apostles consider their bodies tents that they live in. Why is that important? There's a whole stream of thought in the body of Christ. That, well, one thing about it, the real view of man is the Hebrew view, holistic. You know, we have, man can't be divided like that. The Hebrew thought is spirit, soul, body. We're all one. No. The oldest Hebrew book in the Bible, Job, talks about you and I dwelling in houses of clay. The Jewish Apostle Paul, the Jewish Apostle Peter, both considered their bodies just the houses they lived in. How many are tracking with me? This is very helpful when you get sick. You're not sick. You'll never be sick. It's your body only. Thank you, Pat. If your roof has a leak, you're not losing water. Your house is. You just live there. This makes all the difference in the world. When you get a bad doctor's report, it's not about you. It's about your body. Separate yourself from your body and your mind's eye. You just live in this. Amen? Now think about it on the way home. It'll, it'll get you sooner or later. I'm simply trying to make a point. You see how you can build a doctrine on stuff that doesn't make sense or the Bible doesn't substantiate? It's not a matter of Hebrew thought, Greek thought. It's a matter of what the truth is. And according to the Scripture... Our body is a house, and this is a fallen house, and Paul says we're going to get another house. A house is where you live, dwell, yeah, amen. So you're not your body. That's good news. Your, your, your house might need a little work. Ours d does. If you want to pay for it, I'll be glad to tell you where, where to start. It ain't happening right now, but it, it will get to it. And here's the end of the matter now. Here's my paraphrase. The contest, the good one, I contested. The course, I finished. The faith, I kept. Do you know what that word contest comes from? Agona. Or I should say agona. Sound like something? Agony. That's where we get the English word agony from. So he's talking about an athletic contest, you know, boxing or wrestling or something, where you, you sweat, where you toil, you know, where sometimes you're down, sometimes you're up. But here's what he said, I, I contested the good contest. What's a good contest? The one you win. That's right. And what he's basically saying is, I've crossed the line. I've crossed the finish line. I'm a winner. He said, I finished my course. Again, literally, it's, it's, des it's describing you know, uh, a runner, runner's course, or for a horse, you know, uh, Churchill Downs. And he's, he's saying, I kept the faith, which means I protected it. He didn't let anything or anyone sully the truth of the gospel with false doctrine. He didn't let anybody dilute it, or there was no admixture of somebody else's thoughts about it. He kept it pristine and pure. In other words, he said, I played by the rules as a marathoner. I'm not a sprinter. I'm a ma marathoner, and I've made it. I love this. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 6 through 8. Watch this. Henceforth is being laid up for me the crown. Which one's that, Paul? The one of the righteousness, not ours, God's. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will reward to me in the day. What day is that, Master, when he returns? In the day, that one, and not to me only, but rather to all the ones having loved his appearing. How many were here for that series on the second coming? Yeah, this is that word epiphanion, which means a bright, a bright shining 
time. You know, some people try to make the second coming th two comings, not one second coming, but three or whatever. You know, well, you know, first of all, he comes in secretly, then he comes with the bright outshining. Well, you know what? Uh, both words are used of the same event. And Paul says, I'm, I'm excited because I'm going to get this crown at his glorious appearing. And so are you. And so am I. Isn't that good news? It's amazing. It's amazing news. Here's the part I like. Henceforth is being laid up for me. In other words, while Paul was writing this, probably from a prison cell, while he's writing this, in his mind, the computer was still running. He was still laying up rewards for the payday. <laughs> Just amazing. Now, can you imagine what his account looks like 2,000 years later? How many people have read these letters? But while he was writing, I love that. Because for you, for me, for the rest of us that are on this side of the grass, it means there's still time to make our lives count. If, for some reason, we have not been thinking that way. There's still time to get something done for the kingdom of God. There's still some time to make the Lord pleased with us. Isn't that beautiful? So the rewards are still accruing to his account. Same with you, same with me. And let me throw this in about length of days because some of you might think, well, you know, 70, 72, whatever. That's not very, very old, 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 you know. If you're, okay, all right. I'm not there yet and I'm not going to argue with you. You're not exciting me by that response, though. Um, Got to say, it doesn't excite me to think that's what I'm looking for. Um, but think about this. I personally believe, if you look at the Scriptures carefully, length of days in terms of Psalm 91.16 might take on a slightly different meaning for believers. Um, I, I think we have to factor in length of days as a disciple. For example, I don't believe John the baptizer, the second cousin of Jesus, is going to get a demerit because his service was only six months and Paul's was over two decades. I don't think it, it works like that. I think the Lord gives you enough time to finish your course, to run your race, to contest your contest. And if you finish that, whether you're... Four or 40 or 80, you've got length of days. In other words, you cross the line. How many see the, the picture he's painting? So I think, you know, length of days is relative. And if you look in the Old Covenant, some very godly people didn't live all that long, always. Many did, but many did not. And yet we don't find anything in the Scripture one way or another about uh, good, bad, or indifferent. So I think the concept of length of days is there, and I think it is literal, but I think also for believers, we need to factor in length of days as a servant, length of days serving our new master, and that's different for every disciple. Um, you can chew on that. So the end of the matter. Now let's look at his life in the shadow. Let's kind of just sit down with him in that cell. Fortunately, we're not chained. He was. And, and look back with him at how he lived in the light of Psalm 91. I'm suggesting that spirit man lived his life in the shadow. As we saw in Lesson 1 uh, three weeks ago, this is the normal spirit-filled experience of every believer, not just for Paul. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. And that means to pitch a tent. What he's basically saying is, even though I'm persecuted, even though it's not always uh, peaches and cream, I had rather have this Christian life with persecution, where I know that I'm constantly living under this tent, than be in the world and suffering, not for righteousness sake, without that covering, is basically what he's saying. God's power, God's presence, God's protection, God's provision, were his continual companion, continual. I was downtown today, and I, it felt like, for whatever reason, and you've experienced this, we all have, it seemed like God had nothing to do with what I was doing or where I was. 
My favorite, one of my favorite restaurants was still closed. You know, <laughs> I wanted to get mad at him. Why'd you do me this way, Lord? You know, I like that joint. Still closed. You know, couldn't you fix it? <laughs> couldn't you? You're God. You know, I could have gone that route, but obviously I didn't. And uh, I realized when I when I thought about it, going up the elevator, I thought, you know what? God's on His throne. All all's right with the world. He hadn't gone anywhere. It doesn't matter whether the restaurant's open, closed, or in between. I'm, I'm, I'm walking and talking under the shadow of the Most High. doesn't get any better than that. What else do you need? More on Christmas Sunday. I almost didn't get here tonight. I had an experience in prayer this afternoon. I'm telling you what, I was telling Psalm a little bit about it. And I thought, good night, Irene. I hope I can get off this bed. It was it was something. I'm still pondering it. I, I don't know the theology of it all. I'm going to check it out, though. You know me. I'm not going to <laughs> preach something just because of an experience. But God, they're fun when you get them. God love us. Amen. They're fun when they come. And what really else do we need but this canopy? Now, notice you have your Psalm 91 open. He confessed his confidence in God's power to the Apostle Timothy. Look at the first four verses of Psalm 91. The one who's constantly dwelling under the shadow of the Most High, um, and I should say, in the secret of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is what the psalmist said. This is what Paul said. It's what you and I ought to say. I will say, it's actually to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, my Eloel, in, in you will I trust. And Paul lived this. 2 Timothy 1.12, he, pro, he, he proclaims the keeping power of God. 2 Timothy 1.12, for I know whom I believed and stand persuaded that he is able to protect my deposit for the day. That one, same picture, the second coming. And I found something very nice here. When he says, I know the one I've believed and I'm persuaded, the picture is, I believed in God through Christ at a certain point of time, and it has had an ongoing result. In other words, I still have the same faith as the day I met Jesus on the road to Damascus. I was persuaded at a certain point in time that whatever, whatever I do for the kingdom of God will be registered upstairs. My account will not get confused with anyone else. Nothing will be left out, nothing added to. I stand persuaded, same thing. I came to that conclusion at a certain point, and that assurance has remained with me. Never, never, ever, ever entered his mind to change gods, to change religions, to change lifestyles. He was living in the protection of Psalm 91. Because he, he will be rescuing you from the snare of the fowler, from the pestilence of destruction. Under his feathers, he will be covering you, and beneath his wings, you will be taking refuge. His faithfulness is for you a large shield and buckler. How many believe that Paul lived that thing? He testified to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 6, 7, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. And I think probably the picture there is the Roman soldier. If he's left-handed, his sword's in his left hand, his shield's in his right. If he's right-handed, just the reverse. This was Paul. And it worked. How many believe it? It worked. Look at verses 5 and 6. Protection, promise, I should say, of freedom from the fear of the enemy, and doesn't matter when it happens, day or night. How many have gotten attacked more at night by the enemy than day? I don't know what it is about that, about nighttime. I really don't. You know, you can face anything, it seems like, almost anything in the daylight. Nighttime, not so much. Uh, there's a very interesting fellow that I'm sure he's upstairs by now, I heard him preach once. He was an apostle and uh, worked a lot behind the Iron Curtain. 
and he wrote a couple of books for people in apostolic ministry, self-published books, but they still, they still got spread around. And one of the things he brought out in, that, in those books were, was that he had learned through experience as a, an apostolic minister that he needed to pray first thing in the morning and especially last thing at night because he said he found demons were especially active after sundown and before sunrise. In any case, Paul lived, verses 5 and 6, day and night in Acts chapter 9, 25, after he was converted, the scripture says the uh, unbelieving Jewish leaders weren't so crazy about it, and so they, they were going to cancel his ticket, uh, Acts 9, 25, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall, lowering him in a basket. So the enemy tried to cancel his ticket at night, and what happened? Nothing, nothing, amen? Because the Lord alerted Paul and his companions to the plot, and they dropped him over the uh, building wall through a window by a basket. Later on, about three years later, uh, that, that, that trouble was in Damascus. About three years later, in Jerusalem, he was delivered by day. How many of you know there's no day or night with the Lord? Aren't you glad? You know, I don't want to ride the same horse, but yeah. How many days I walked past that restaurant? Big white sign in the window. I don't want to see that closed, you know. Oh, you know. Oh. Wouldn't that be terrible if the kingdom of God oper operated that way? Lord, oh. Closed for repair and maintenance, you know. <laughs> Not cool. Not cool. I'm glad that does not happen upstairs, aren't you? He was delivered by day, Acts 22, verse 18, when he was going to be facing persecution in Jerusalem. This was daytime. He writes, second, I'm sorry, Acts 22, 18. He said to me, speaking of the Lord Jesus, depart, for I will send you out far from here to the Gentiles. Once again, the plot was foiled and Paul escaped. Listen to uh, verses 7 through 10. A thousand, they will be falling from your side, even 10,000 from your right side, but it will not approach to you. Only with your eyes will you be looking upon the reward or the requital of the lawless ones. You will be seeing that with your own eyes. This actually was lived out by Paul. You indeed, O Yahweh, are my refuge. The Most High, you have put me in your dwelling place, or actually you have made me inaccessible. Just like the eagle in the cleft of the rock, you can't get to him. And this happened for Paul. Uh, when was that, Pastor? Well, I'm not going to read it all, but let me just give you the, the, the reference. 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29. How many are familiar with that? Those are some of the verses in your Bible that are not underlined, they're not highlighted, they're not circled. They're the kinds most preachers never visit. Labors more abundantly, prisons more abundantly, stripes above measure, deaths often, deaths plural, often. Five times from the Jews, 40 stripes minus one. Three times beaten with rods, once stoned. Three times suffered shipwreck. I think once would be enough for me. How about you? Man, when that plane was going down on the way to Crete, I was not excited about that. Man, I probably still have marks on my forearms from where Yana dug her fingernails in. But uh, we're going down, Jimmy, we're going. But we, we were, but we didn't. And that was once. That's enough for me. Three times, three times he almost had his ticket canceled. I preached on this one, a night and a day in the deep. wonder what that was like. And on and on it goes. I don't want to keep it up. You'll be really depressed. We, we don't want to do that. We're not trying to depress you. But listen to what he said along the same line. Obviously, he lived through that, didn't he? He lived through that. Listen to what he said about uh, the same concept of, of evil around him and so on. 
to, to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3.11, persecutions and sufferings, those things that happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, I endured those persecutions, but the Lord delivered me out of them all. Sometimes the only way out is through. Sometimes the only way out is through. And that's what Paul learned. But he was delivered. Would you agree? That's why we started at the end. He's testifying. I've been through hell and high water, as it were, but I'm still here. I made it. And I'm not just going to limp into glory. I'll, I'll, I'll cruise in there with my head held high. I finished my race. I contested my contest, and I kept the faith intact. In other words, I'm going upstairs with a good report. Despite the enemy's continued attempts, he remained finally immune to trouble. It said something similar to what I just quoted in 2 Timothy 4. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now that could be literally delivered from being thrown to the lions, or it could refer to being delivered from an ungodly a leader that could have ordered his ticket canceled. I asked you a couple of minutes ago if, uh, if you've ever been sick. Yeah, most of us have. If you have not heard me mention this, please, uh, please think about this. Paul also knew about sickness. A lot of people paint the picture of Paul being superhuman, Man of faith, you know, and obviously was never ill because he was living in the fullness of the gospel, and that's where we're supposed to be. And if, you, if you're sick, well, some people won't say it outright, but they kind of, well, I wonder what he did. I wonder what she did to bring that on after all, you know. You know what? The guy that gave these hyper-faith people some of the scriptures that they're twisting himself was ill, and he talked about it, and he didn't seem the slightest bit ashamed he didn't seem the slightest bit defeated. Is that in the scripture, Pastor? Yeah, it really is. Uh, could you tell me where? Yeah, I'll read it to you. Galatians 4, 13 and 14. Galatians 4, 13 and 14. We're talking about the blessings of Psalm 91, 7 through 10. This is what he said to the Galatians. But you know that because of weakness or sickness of the flesh, Asthenia, nine times out of ten, refers to physical illness in the New Testament. Any honest person with access to the text knows this. You know that because of the sickness of my flesh, I preached the good news to you the first time. That which was a temptation to you in my flesh, or trial, you didn't despise nor reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ himself. When he first got to Galatia, one of the reasons he preached there was because he had to stop because he was ill. Now, let me ask you a question. Did he stay ill? Obviously not. God healed him while he was there, but he was ill. And he made lemonade out of lemons. Basically said, all right, Sade, you're going to make me sick? I'll fix you. I'll get some people healed and saved and full of the Holy Ghost while I recover. And he did, and he went on his way rejoicing. He wasn't talking to the undertaker in this jail cell that he's writing from. But I'm, I'm trying to make the point that he was sick. Let me tell you something else about that. He calls sickness a trial. It's the same word used of temptation. There hath no temptation. It's the same, same word. Pirazo, to test. Pirasmos, a trial. For there is no temptation, according to Paul, you could say there's no sickness overtaken you, but such as is common to man. How many are glad about that? Usually when I take an illness, I'll immediately try to think of some believer that had it and got over it. Yeah, it's encouraging. There's no temptation, test or trial, sickness included, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. He'll never allow you to be tempted, tested or tried. Sick above your present level of ability, but always right alongside it, provide the alternative outcome so that you can carry away something you never would have gotten any other way. I was talking to one of our precious members just this week about emotional turmoil and nervous problems and this, that, and the other thing. Boy, I wouldn't wish that kind of stuff on my worst enemy. I've had several episodes throughout my life, and um, I got to tell you, if it's between that and physical sickness, I got to really think about it. 
Sometimes I'd almost prefer physical pain, but here's the deal. When you come out of that, you carry away from that something that you literally couldn't have gotten any other way. You begin to relate to people in a different way. You're not so much going to give them, take two, take two scriptures and call me in the morning, you know, like some of the knuckleheads that broke your heart. You're looking for help and they give you more trouble. It, well, it's not supposed to be that way. Paul wasn't that way. Why? He had already been through it. How many are glad about this? I am. This is called Christianity in shoe leather. This is the gospel where we live. This is not, you know, some heresy that someone dreamed up or concocted so they could sell books. This is the Bible. This is Paul. He, he, he's gone to where we're still headed. Amen. And living to tell about it. Isn't that something? Uh, I'm almost done. In verses 11 and 12, he's promised the help of the angels, isn't he? Right? The angels of God, the angels of God will be commanded to guard us in all of our ways. Verse 12, Psalm 91, on their hands they will be lifting you up so that you will not be striking your foot on the stone. Everybody say the stone. Yeah, there's actually an article there. I personally believe that Satan sometimes puts particular problems in our pathway to trip us up. It's not just any old stone. It's not just any old stumbling block. It's one he actually set there to take us out. Do you know if he had his way, we'd all be six feet under. If we had spiritual eyes to see, there's a battle going on over our head 24-7. But we're protected the same way Paul was. How many are glad? Did he get the uh, help from angels? Yeah, you've read it. Acts 27, 21 through 26. I think I've got that written down. When they'd been a long time without food, Paul stood up in the middle and said... This is, they're, they're fixing to die in a shipwreck. Sirs, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and have gotten this injury and loss. I exhort you now to cheer up. There will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Oh, yeah, easy for you to say. You're not a, you're not a, a ship master. Uh, you don't even fish a lick. But here, don't be afraid. For there stood by me this night an angel belonging to the God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Stop fearing, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted to you all those who sail with you. Therefore, sirs, cheer up, for I believe God. It'll be just as it has been spoken to me, but we must first run aground on a certain island. You know, you can almost stop there and preach a month. <laughs> Forgive me, but I just get so tired of hopefully well-meaning preachers still causing Christians a lot of trouble. Why couldn't he just confess the boat there? You say it enough, you'll have what you say, right? We're there, we're there, we're there, we're there. Why, do, why does the ship have to run aground? Why does it have to fall to pieces? It almost sounds like God's in charge and not us. Just a thought, just a thought. You and I can mouth off all we want, but if God's not behind it, it's just a tinkling cymbal and a clanging gong. Let's wake up and smell the coffee. Amen? Hopefully it's Folgers. He also had dominion over demons, didn't he? Yeah. Verse 13 says, You will tread on serpents and scorpions. You'll trample the lion and the young lion and the serpent. Jesus said the very same thing. And, of course, Acts 16, we see that coming to pass. The Bible says he turned to the little girl that had the spirit of the python and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. You like these exorcism movies? Oh, aren't they? Aren't they, they something? <laughs> holy water. Oh, holy salt, you know. <laughs> and it's almost like a train, five or six priests, one behind the other, you know, pushing push the other. Don't get too close. If it comes out, it might get into us, you know. And, I just saw a documentary the other day. Fair Dinkum, this is a real deal. It was a real exorcism. You know, they actually had the cameras in there and everything. And they were talking about how many times they'd done this. And it went on for months. And they thought she probably needed a couple of more. But she felt the pass. She thought she's pretty, pretty well there. You know, I guess most of them were out. So she could probably live with the rest, maybe charge them rent. I don't know. Isn't that sad? I talk to them and, you know, play games with them. I've been at this a little while. I've never had to do that. I never would do it. 
Never, ever, ever. I don't like messing with that stuff, but when it happens, you've got to deal with it. But I'm just saying, nobody wants to fool around with that. And Paul did, and he just, boom, you're out. What did what, what those devils say to the seven sons of Sceva? Jesus we know, and Paul we're acquainted with, but you, who are you? That's awesome. That's what's, literally what the demon said. You, who are you? And attacked them. And they ran out naked and wounded rather than the demon <laughs> coming out. So don't use the name of Jesus like a magic amulet or a rabbit's foot. It doesn't work that way. Thousands of people are named Jesus in South America. They're not doing any miracles. Good preaching, Pastor. Take the offering while you got them all worked up. Oh, praise God. Amen. Finally, Paul enjoyed the blessing described in Acts, uh, I'm sorry, in, in uh, verse 14 of Psalm 91. Because he is devoted to me, I will set him free. I will make him inaccessible because he knows my name. If you read Acts chapter 16, verses 25 and 26, the Bible says about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God while the, while the prisoners were listening. Suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. And that's something. When's the last time you heard of an earthquake like that? Selective earthquake. The building didn't fall down, just the doors opened. Nobody was hurt, just the bracelets came off there wrists and their ankles. That's the kind of earthquake I want to be involved in. If I have to go to any, I know I'd rather give it a hard pass, period. Um, and once more, he was comforted. We're talking about God being with him and, and, uh, and answering his prayer and calling upon him. Verse 15, and being delivered by the Lord in adversity. Psalm 91, verse 15. Paul lived it all. Paul lived it all. In Acts chapter 18, Verses 9 and 10, I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating, especially today when this whole world is, quote, unquote, going to hell in a handbasket. Let's just be honest about it. Talking to a friend of mine the other day, he said, the world's gone crazy. He said, everybody's nuts. I said, I know. I said, how in the world do people live without the Lord in this crazy world? I have a message on that. It's on the website, Escape This Crazy World. How many like to do that? Very simple, just get saved. Yeah, that's it. I said to save you listening to that message now. But think about this. He's in a city of Corinth, old Corinth. It's just ruins now. There's a new one. Old Corinth was kind of like Times Square or King's Cross in Sydney or some other really highly populated place or the worst part of L.A. times a million. It was just absolutely horrific, spiritually speaking. It was totally given over to false gods. And Paul I don't know about you, but I, I look at Paul, and he put his pants on one leg at a time, just like we do. And he was afraid. He probably figured, how long is a Jewish rabbi talking about a Jewish God whose son, the God-man, a Jewish rabbi, died in their place and in their name? Who, who in Corinth, all these pagan Greeks with their pantheon of hundreds of gods, everything around had a, had a God for it. How in the world are they going to let me keep preaching this? And God knew he needed a little assist. He needed a lift. And so Jesus appeared to him. What did he tell him? Yeah, it's pretty tough. Let's come home. What did, what did he, I'm glad I'm not there. What did he say? The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, stop fearing, but speak and stop being silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in the city. This one. Wow. You can have a revival in Times Square or King's Cross or Los Angeles. You got the real deal. Amen? How many like the last blessing where we started? Just before verse 16. The last blessing is, I will set him apart and honor him. Everybody say honor. honor. Guess what? The word honor there actually means prosper. God will abundantly provide for our needs. Those of us like Paul that live under the shadow of the Most High. Any, any scripture for that? Yes. Yes. 
you should say, Pastor, say it. Why? Because then I'll be done. Acts 28.10, when Paul and Luke and the others were fixing to leave the island of Malta and they had done all that healing, they are there for about three months, had a tremendous healing crusade. The Bible says, speaking of the people, they also honored us with many honors. That does not mean they, they saluted him, you know, or gave him a, a little a hand on the back. It, it means they loaded them up with stuff. He had so much stuff when he got to Rome, he held a house prayer meeting for two years without taking an offering. They also honored us with many honors. And when we sailed, they put on board the things that we needed. Acts 28.10. We have this view of Paul sometimes that he was always broke. He wasn't always broke. He was like most preachers, ebb and flow, ebb and flow, ebb and flow. Philippians 4.18, he writes to that church, but I have all things and abound. I'm filled, having received from Epaphroditus the things that came from you, a sweet-smelling fragrance, an acceptable and well-pleasing sacrifice to God. If you've ever given to the work of God, that's one you ought to underline, highlight, and circle. If you've ever helped a man or woman of God, if you've ever helped the work of God, God considers that a sweet-smelling savor of rest, if you will, if you want to go to the Old Testament sacrifices. Ah, they're taking care of her. Ah, they're taking care of him. They're taking care of them. They're partnering. Ah, it pleases God. How many want to please God? One final example of God, Yahweh, honoring him, prospering him. He writes to his friend Philemon. I've got a friend named Philemon, Greek scholar. He writes to Philemon about uh, this slave that had been a crook but had left and while he was gone Paul had gotten him saved he sent him back to this Philemon and this is what Paul says to his friend but if he speaking of the Onesimus the crook who became a believer but if he has wronged you at all or owes you anything put that to my account I Paul write this with my own hand I will repay it how on God's green earth are you going to stand for somebody else's debt if you're looking for a handout. Do you see how we need to balance some of our teachings? Stay in the middle lane. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Paul wasn't always broke, nor was he always staying in five-star hotels. It was ebb and flow. My point is, he enjoyed this blessing too. And there, I've given you three, probably more examples of this, that God took care of Paul so much to the place where at this point he was able to be good for somebody else's debt. We don't know how much he ripped off his master from or with. But Paul said, it's okay. Um, I'm good for it. If you need paid back, I'll do it. That's nice, isn't it? So there it is. Paul's life in the shadow, illustrated from the scripture, a lot from the book of Acts, but in from his letters too. How many feel like that Paul had a, a life well lived. Amen. How many wouldn't mind finishing up like he did? How many are kind of right in the middle of it now? Yeah. Some of us are farther along. Some right smack dab in the middle. Some like little Emma just starting out. Missy tells me that she might, that little girl that got the baptism, she might even be, she might be speaking Russian, they reckon, supernaturally. Can you imagine? How cool would that be? Or some Middle East, uh, Far Eastern uh, language. Wow, that is just too cool. Any questions, input or output tonight? We'll come around the Lord's Supper. Anyone? Yeah, Mike. How many hours a day Paul us prayed the Spirit? Four or five. The question is a direct record of how much Paul spent in with the Lord in prayer. Not that I'm aware of. But, you know, I think that the key one is 1 Corinthians 14, 18. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. And he was correcting the Corinthians because they were doing it apparently all the time and no interpreter publicly. So, you know, my guess is he was very much like we are today. Probably while he's working his tent trade, he'd be praying undertone, you know. I'm giving you, forget the personal reference, but my own life I used to work in radio. And that's back in the old days when they had those real to real tapes. You put the preacher's tape on, it might, might run an hour. You're in the control room. I just prayed, 
and changed that tape, put another one on, just prayed hours and hours every day. I was talking to Jeff about it the other day. I'm sure I prayed a lot of my missionary work to, to Australia through in advance, a year or two in advance. He had the same thing. He was going to a certain church, and for about four or five months, if, you, if I remember it right, he was going to a prayer meeting at that church every morning, praying hours before he went to, to his radio job. And he said, looking back, the same thing. He said, all the different stations he's been at, and all the different things he's done for the kingdom, this ministry he's worked with. He said, I'll bet I prayed a lot of that through in advance. You know, so answer to your question, I'm sure hours every day, hours. Yeah, that's why when he, if you speak 10,000 words in a tongue, as it were, privately, when you're in the meeting, you only need five words, like to that crippled guy, stand upright on your feet. Um, what's happening in my opinion today is a lot of believers have got the speaking part down, but they don't want the other part. You mean I can't just do this whenever I want to? Yeah, you can, but nothing will happen. Well, you mean I got to pray a lot? Your choice. Oh, I'm not so excited about that. Answer your question? Yeah. No. <laughs> Did you hear that? It shouldn't take six months for an exorcism. No. But that's another good example. Yeah, he didn't have a... How, why was it that he was able to do that? Boom, and it just came out. You ever ask yourself this question? Why didn't he do it the day before? Thanks, Mark. I, I think if I hear one more believer <laughs> publicly saying things like this, God's given us this authority, and it's, it's a half-truth. God, you know, the, the commanding officer gives a soldier a rifle, too. That doesn't mean he fires at any time he takes an ocean. What if he lost a card game? Boom, you know. Kill his own man, for, you know, friendly fire. You, you see how crazy this is. You get the idea that because we have authority, and we do, because we have access to the arsenal of God, and we do, that, that it also means we can just do whatever we want. Like we're a car and God's power is gas and we get filled up and then just go out and drive wherever we want. You know, God's power is a person. Why didn't Paul cast the devil out the day before? Because he wasn't anointed to do it then. <laughs> oh man, this is so much fun. It takes all the pressure off when we really believe the Bible. But he wants to imitate Paul, but they don't imitate Paul. They come up with this goofy stuff, and you can tell because the, in the meetings, nothing ever happens. I quit going to these meetings years ago because they can tell you how to do it, and then they can't do it. I'll not call his name. Really famous preacher was in town, and I have a friend that was at the meeting. I said, anything happened? said, not that I could tell, but he took two hours to take the offering. If the signs were following, it must have been a long time after. Because nothing happened. Hadn't been back. I guess he didn't get enough money. I'll, I'm stopping. Anybody else? Isn't this sad? You guys know it's true. You know it's true. You know it's true. Where's, where are the Pauls today? Where is the true apostolic ministry today where something actually happens? I'm not saying it's not, but boy, it's sure not showing up much that I can see. Back in the days of the voice of healing, you didn't have to ask. What's, where's it happening? You, you just went to their meetings. Didn't matter which of those preachers was preaching. They were all doing the same thing, you know. And God, give us another, another crop. Amen. Anybody else got something? I'm sorry to, to get overheated. Anybody else? We're going to come around the Lord's table. If you're giving tonight, there are baskets here, one in the hall. Um, and God will bless you. Wrap your seed with faith. And we, uh, this is the... Uh, Maestro, God bless you, brother. Uh, to say it periodically when we get visitors, we do not practice closed communion. You don't have to be a member of this church to take the Lord's Supper, as long as you're a member of God's church. Amen.